Well, since we're going to talk about this, I think I should prepare. You. You will like my video. Hello and welcome back to another Midnight Showing. As always, I'm Kelly and I just got out of Get Out. And oh my god, this movie was awesome. Okay, full disclosure. If you wanted to know if this movie is worth seeing, go see it. Go see it right now. This movie is just <laughs> so much better if you don't know what's going to happen going into it. All I knew was that there's hypnotism and weird white people talking to a black guy. That's it. You know, this movie, just... Don't get me wrong. It has problems. But basically all of them can be forgiven for just how well told this story really is. And frankly speaking, just the amazing writing on display. So just go watch it. No spoilers. Go watch it now. Don't worry. I'll wait. When you come back, be sure to just start the video at this spot and we'll talk about it. Go ahead, go. What? Do you need more motivation here? Just one second. I swear, sometimes you guys can't do anything on your own. Go and watch the film. Get out in theaters. You will pay full price. And then you will transfer all of your money to account number 613-796-2941. Got it? Let's talk about this movie. Okay, starting off. For those who don't know, this is uh, written and directed by Jordan Peele of Key and Peele fame. And by God, you would not think that a comedian would be able to write such a great horror film, but that's what we got. The movie has moments where it is hilarious, where it just says the right joke at the right time that kind of adds to the atmosphere. It's kind of like laughing at the Joker. You really shouldn't be laughing at this, but that pencil through the eye is just so goddamn entertaining. And don't get the idea that there's anything really overly gory. It does have one sequence near the end that one could consider gory, but really it wasn't that bad. And you would think that the humor would actually, you know, detract from the movie. But as I said, it actually enhances it. You know, being laughing at this very awkward situation, which is a good way of describing about 60% of this film, very awkward. And that kind of comes from the racism involved here, but we'll talk about that in a second. Needless to say, the awkward atmosphere of... What's going on? Why is everyone acting weird? You know, having to actually, you know, figure out and piece this all together, it's pretty in intriguing and just on the edge of your seat combined with just the really wonky atmosphere. It's just the writing here is on point. The writing sells about 75% of this situation. The other 25% is directorial, and I have to say, Jordan Peele still did an amazing job with that, too. I'm not going to say it's the best direction I've ever seen in my life. I kind of would have liked a few more odd angles here and there, just kind of emphasize the awkwardness of the situation. You know, have it framed slightly off. Everything is framed pretty straight on, and that's... Not a negative in the film by any stretch of the imagination. It's just what I would prefer, and maybe a more experienced director would have done something like that, kind of mixed it up a bit. But considering that Jordan Peele normally does comedy with his friend Key in movies like Keanu or their sketch show on Comedy Central, it says a fucking lot that this movie is directed as well as it is. And I want to see more from you. I don't care if you're going to be doing horror films or comedies. Because between Keanu and this film, you guys have earned the right to basically do whatever the fuck you want for at least a few more movies before I start bitching. 
But that's not to undersell the acting on display here. And from, for the most part, general nobodies inside of the cast. I could not tell you a single name of any of the actors in this movie off the top of my head, except for the blind art dealer. Yes, there's a blind art dealer. They make that joke too. With the exception of him, who I can't think of his name, but I can think of like five movies he's been in. Although I have to say the shout out actor inside of this film has to go to its lead, Daniel Kalaluya. I can't, sorry, I probably butchered your last name. I suck at that. Watch my previous videos, it's a thing. And a lot of his acting comes off very subtle and subdued. He's trying to stay straight in this insane situation. And even when he can't stay straight, he's still trying to maintain some composure to an extent, which gives him a very, very, very subtle... You have to look at his... Perf yeah. Most of his acting throughout this whole movie is very, very subtle and subdued. It's... I'm not going to say restrictive. It's just that his character is trying to stay the straight man, even when very awkward things are going on around him, like people feeling up his arms, talking about how he's genetically predisposed to being better, and how, you know, it's amazing that a hundred years later, black is back in fashion. You know, all done by white people who are creepily grabbing you and old and shit. Yeah, I don't know how he did it. Most of his acting comes from the very minor ticks and things you see in his facial expressions. And it does give you ample time to actually look at them because a lot of this is done in close-ups. Which, most of them work. We'll talk about the few that don't in the next section because they're more in the later part of the film when we're actually going to get into the big heavy-duty spoilers. But you can actually really, really follow and feel for this guy even if you're not... Well, black. And there's really no way of dancing around it. We're going to have to actually talk about it. The one of the things that works heavily in this movie's favor is its racism. And I'm not talking about the outright racism, you know. You stupid nigger, you get down, you get back to saving my belly butt. You know, not that stupid shit that a lot of people assume is racism still. Yes, it is, but it's not really, you know, today's racism. Today's racism is more overt. As I said, this movie is very, very awkward. And you have a lot of people pointing out that this one guy in this group of people is black. And it's not really something that this guy wants to be a part of or be in. And the weird fascination that they have when they're talking about him, about his predisposition to being strong and liking UFC and all this other stuff. It's just, okay, maybe back up a bit, you know, maybe not talk about all of these random things. I mean, hell, they even make a big black dick joke inside of this movie. Something I was not expecting them to make. And when it comes up, I mean, you just, like, see the main character, played by Daniel, and his girlfriend. You know, you just see their faces go. I mean, the moment is priceless. But it really does help set the atmosphere here. So that when the big twist reveal that comes near the third act actually does happen as to why everything is as awkward as it is and why everything is happening, especially with how these people are talking, it really does cement that this is kind of a race thing. <laughs> and I don't just mean like, kind of. This is racism in a way that I've kind of been complaining about for years, although not on camera. The weird fascination we have with the black culture just in general. And yeah, this part's going to get kind of political, so if you want to skip ahead, I don't blame you. But yeah, as white people, we always seem to want to be black these days, even though they're still treated relatively like crap. You know, we always want to be gangster. We want to be hip. We want to do the hip hop and the rap, y'all. 
And that kind of mentality plays into this movie a lot. <laughs> and, yeah, you can see by the main character's portrayal how he actually does see this type of racial fanaticism, I guess you could call it. And as one of the side characters actually puts it, black is in fashion. And that's all it is. It's fashion. It's fashion racism. I know that's kind of a weird concept, but you completely feel it inside of this movie, and it does help emphasize this is not normal. And look, I understand. I'm white. I live in Utah, where about 90% of the population across the state are white. <laughs> so, yes, I completely understand this is not... I am not the person who should be talking about this. And you'll probably get a better experience by looking at anybody else. Hell, go look at uh, Andre the Black Nerd on YouTube. He did a great review of this, and he talked about this much better than I ever could. I'll put a link to his channel in the description if you can't already find him. He's got like almost 750,000 subs, so it shouldn't be hard. But yeah, the racism involved in this whole situation, as told very correctly by... Jordan Peele's writing and direction and portrayed perfectly by his actors, you know, it really does help to emphasize the awkwardness of this movie and why it's not something that we should like. Huh. I just went through the entire good section without actually spoiling what this whole twist was. Unfortunately, that kind of leads us into... This is going to be a very brief section because any quibbles I have are at most nitpicks. This is still a great horror film and it's certainly a lot better than anything I've seen this year. So, with all that said, what is the big twist of the movie? So, it turns out that the entire family, including uh, Daniel Kulia's, sorry about the name pronunciation, girlfriend played by... Allison Williams, I hope I said that right. Yeah, they're actually doctors performing brain surgery, and they literally take one person's brain and put it into a new person's body. And Daniel, his name, the character's name's Chris, he's their next target. And he has been sold to this blind art dealer who wants Chris's eye, because he's got not just great vision but an eye for photography which he'd been doing throughout the whole movie and it was used as his excuse to get out of very awkward situations here's the problem with this it is really fucking silly for this movie that was pretty grounded in realism up until this point again not a nitpick it's not as jarring as the rape sequence inside of don't breathe but it is still a little jarring, especially when you're going into magic hypnotism powers. Oh, and, oh yeah, the hypnotism thing? Yeah, for those who didn't get the joke, this is how she hypnotizes people. They even make reference to the point, you know, it's all about creating a focal point to put you in a suggestive state. You know, they, the coin is the focal point when you're doing the dangling string thing. For her, it's an auditory focal point. She spins her spoon in her teacup and lulls you into a suggestive state. In which all of you should be properly hypnotized at this point, so subscribe, share the video, fall into the sunken place and let me take over your body because I have a surgeon who will transfer my brain into your body, your much more healthy body and less fat. Ooh. Yeah, you went from magic hypnotism powers to literally brain surgery and body transference. Kind of jumped a few places there. And this over-the-top jump, especially when there was a bunch of jump scares earlier, granted they are much more tastefully done inside this movie than in other ones, but there are still some pretty cheap ones. And I kind of hate myself because I actually got caught off guard by one of them. The setup was there. You know, Chris has to go downstairs and he's trying to sneak outside so he can sneak a cig cigarette without waking anybody. <laughs> and... Of course, while he's walking by, someone rushes from the camera and you hear the vroom, orchestra string, and it actually fucking got me. And that pisses me off, because as I've stated in other videos, I 
don't I know the setups for these jump scares and it's like three two one jump scare I'm able to do that very easily and the fact that this stupid dumbass jump scare got me pisses me off maybe that's just a testament to how good the previous parts of the film were at setting the mood and the atmosphere that I was kind of lulled into uh false sense of security not thinking this was actually going to happen but it does happen more than once inside of the film and after the first time they actually caught me, I was able to catch on to it, and I was like, okay, jump scare, jump scare. It's still a Blumhouse production, even though it's clearly done by someone who's not really going to do all that stuff. Uh, it just, I wish I had done less of that and just stuck to the atmosphere before the big reveal. And also, the ending is... It's both amazing and very, very jarring. How's the best way to describe this? So the main character, Chris, was actually able to pick up about the whole auditory part of the hypnosis. And even though he's tied to a chair, he was able to rip out some of the stuffing in said chair and shove it in his ears so that when they do the thing, he just played along and he didn't actually get hypnotized. Okay, kudos. Smart mate character actually taking, picking up on context clues and taking advantage of what he can to get out of the situation. And he actually gets into fights with some of these characters, like his girl, previous girlfriend's brother. I'm not going to call her current girlfriend because, let's face it, you're not together after she signs you up for brain surgery. And that fight kind of felt, you know, real because it was just... Chris grabbing whatever and fighting with what he could. But then we get into absolute silly territory when he takes out the father, who is the actual brain surgeon inside of this, by literally taking down the mounted head of a deer with its ant massive antlers, running down a hallway and skewering the guy in the fucking head with its antlers. Okay. I get the poetic irony there because the father had said earlier in the film after they actually had hit a fucking deer that, you know, you should just kill them all off. You know, every time you kill off a deer, that's just one less them to do it. So the fact that he's actually getting killed by a fucking deer's head, I get the poetic irony of that. But this is really silly considering how far he had to run down that hallway without being heard with this massive fucking head whose antlers are easily almost the entire size of the fucking hallway without even so much the guy turning towards them until the very last second where he skewers him it it's silly it's very very silly then we get a rematch between Chris and the brother he had previously fought downstairs when he got out of the chair with a fucking croquet ball. Even though he clearly smashed his head in so much and how much blood was on the floor, he should have been dead. You know, these guys aren't superhuman. They're just very sick and disgusting. So, why wasn't this guy dead? You know, as I said, it just gets kind of silly here. But... The reason why this ending is amazing is because it actually combines everything that we've learned up until this point. Uh, we have, you know, the different weapons, the poetic irony with the deer, uh, the fucking uh, flash that sets people off and reestablishes their previous personality, if only for a short time. All of this comes into play to go into this climax and when the cop car shows up at the fucking end, and you think it's that stupid-ass racist cop from the beginning of the movie, and it turns out not to be, it's a legitimate surprise and breath of fresh air at the end of this very intense final act of a movie. And that's why I say it's amazing. It's just that when you think about it and try to explain it, it's very silly. Again, nitpicks. At best, these are all nitpicks. It just... They have to be addressed because this isn't a perfect movie. Hell, I'd even argue it's not even a great movie. It's just a damn good one. So with that said, let's get into... This is a highly suspenseful, very engaging, very thought-provoking with its racist comments film that I think everyone should go see. Is it going to be in my best of the year? Probably not. I mean, fuck, there's a lot of films that I still have to see through. 
But I would not be surprised if this at least gets an honorable mention from me. So with all that said, my personal final verdict in this film is that it is a must-see. And I feel really bad if you actually end up watching the whole video, so now you're spoiled to it all. Because really going into this without knowledge of what they're doing, why they're doing it, and why everyone apparently wants a black guy for this, you know, it really does add something to the experience. So I do feel bad if you actually ended up getting to this point in my video without seeing it. But you should still go see it anyway, because it's just that fucking entertaining. And yeah, that's it for me. Did you enjoy the video? Have you seen Get Out? Tell me what you thought about it in the comments down below, and maybe we'll get some healthy discussion going. And as always, if you like the video, be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more. Trust me, it helps me out more than anything that you else you could do. Be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I'm going to be doing some stuff on all of those here in the next little while, so stay tuned. And yeah, that's it for me, so I'll see you all next time.